This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? What's up? Yo. Hello. I just realized that somebody is not just cutting grass. I think they are like running a leaf vacuum next door. So it's like the opportune time to start doing that because it's podcast time. So <laughs> don't they know? They don't listen. They don't know. Wow. Shannon always jokes that she's going to order me like one of those like recording lights for my door, but I really need one for my house. So my neighbors know what's up, you know? So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just put it above your mailbox. So <laughs> we are back from RubyCon. And that's been nice. And Jason, on the last podcast that we recorded live, I called you out in front of everybody. <laughs> and I want to apologize for that. It's all right. <laughs> it's fine. I mean, you were right too. I was working uh, up the courage all week to be like, oh, I need to go apologize to Emily. And then you're like, oh, Jason, by the way, you really suck. Yeah, but I love you. It's okay. I have a disease. So Chris, you want to introduce our guest? Yes. What a good intro. Yeah, this week we have Raphael from Shopify here to chat about all things Rails and Ruby and all that. So welcome, Raphael. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. We're super glad to have you. I was curious, like to start off, what got you into Ruby and eventually into Rails? I think it all started when I was in doing computer science. I had to do a class about soft engineering design. And the project was about writing a web application in Java. And that was in 2007, I believe. And I don't know if you remember Java in 2007, like if you had to write a web application, you probably needed to try to put a bunch of things that don't work well together and configure a lot of XML files to actually make it work. And I really found that very difficult. And I thought with myself, I don't believe this is the best way to write web applications in the world. I actually ended up finding a framework in Java called JBossing. And this framework had generators that you could just run a command and get an entire Java application running, configured for you. And I said, okay, this is a very smart idea. And while reading the, the documentation, I found that those generators were inspired by a framework called the Ruby Rails. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. Let me see what this Ruby Rails is about. And I think I started to read one book. I don't remember which one, probably the Agile Web Development with Rails. And I f- felt in love with the language. I started to follow more people on Twitter that like were Ruby developers. I think a, a few of them, I already knew. Martin Fowler was a good example because he was prominent in the Ruby community at the time. Same with Andy Hunt, Frank Toby. And I said, okay, like I know those people and they are writing books about Ruby. It must be something that is a good or fun language, right? And I think after a few months, then we started to have the Merb versus Rails war, right? Like, <laughs> and, and that was also a very fun time to be in the Ruby community because we had a lot of content coming out at the time. Like, you know, at Scholar, share most of the people in the, the Merb party writing like very technical blog posts explaining why Merb was better than Rails, writing blog posts explaining why Rails like made those choices and why they think this, that was better. And in Christmas of that year, like Merby and Rails decided to merge and Rails is shattered. In particular, one person to caught my attention, Jose Valin, because he was a Brazilian. And I, as a Brazilian, never had a kind of a role model in the software world, right? Like we know that most of the language designers and framework creators are, are not from Brazil, except from one person that's Jose Valin and another one that's actually two more that are the Lua language creators. But I said, okay, if this guy, this Brazilian person can do, I can do it as well. So I actually like set up as my personal goal to work with Jose Valin. I said, I want to work with this guy. One year later, I actually got to work with Jose for years. And that's how I started with Ruby. And working with Jose was also how I started contributing to with Rails because I had he like available to ask questions and like kind of also the same the direction the framework was was going 
and what they needed the help with. So for me, that was how I got started with Reyes. That's awesome. When you say you worked with Jose, was that at Performance Tech? Yes. All right. What was that experience like? Until a few years ago, I would say that was my best experience working in tech ever. We had a very strong team. I also felt that I had a lot of friends. The team was small at the time. Like I joined the company with 10 people and then I left the company. The company was with 30 people four years after I joined. So it was a very slow growing team, but a lot of very good technical people. Like most of the either wrote books about Ruby or Elixir or like front-end development. They create a lot of libraries we use today in the Ruby community still, like device simple form. And they also create a new programming language called Elixir that like is also like a very good language with a lot of people wanting to learn it. But I think I changed my opinion about being the best work in my life because after I joined Shopify, I was able to build a team by myself, like growing from one person to 42 people. Bigger than platform attack at the time. And now I am very happy with the team built. So I think it's comparable with platform attack at the time. I wonder if, could you give like a brief explanation of the Rails versus Merb war? Because that was, a lot of our listeners probably have no idea what that was about because we have a lot of junior listeners. Okay, so yeah. you can give like the simple explanation of what that was about. So... I think the main point of that war was that Rails is still is very opinionated, but at the time you had no options to remove things or even like, I want to swap this part of Rails from this other part. A very good example is test frameworks. Like some people prefer RSpec, some people prefer mini tests. And at the time, it was not possible to you to generate a Rails application and say, I want RSpec. Today it is. And that's one of the things that we got from Merb because Merb was also a very minimal framework. Rails is like, is a better is included framework. It gives you everything you need to remove. Merb was the opposite. It gave you just the minimal amount of things you needed and you need to build on top of it. So that's one of the ideas that we had difference between. The other one was like in terms of performance because Rails was a better or better is included framework. It loaded way more than you needed. And Merb being the opposite, like one of the selling points is like Merb is more performant because we don't need to load a lot of things. And I think those were the main difference. But after like Rails and Merb got merged, most of those ideas got integrated to what today we call Rails 3. And Rails 3 had this new architecture that was like more modular, more you can swap things and I think one of the reasons I mean here in this podcast was actually spending crazy about this like more modular approach that Rails took. We use the engineers, rail ties. All of that came from like the Merb and Rails merge. Was, yeah. was the Merb Rails merge what became like Rails 3 release? Yes. That was like just before my time. I hate I missed all this. Some of the things that were created during that time are still being used today and actually became kind of staples of the Ruby community. A good example is Bundler. Like we had no Bundler uh, at the time. And Bundler was created as one of the projects at Engineer Art to support Merp. Because Rails, like in Rails 2, for example, you could tell that like you depend on image magic or you could tell that your application depends on device. But you could not tell which version of the device of image mesh would be. Neither like we had a good way to tell, okay, if you install image mesh 3, we need MailJ version 2. But like Ruby says would install uh, MailJ version 3 and your application will not boot. So there was no way to actually resolve dependencies in a minimal sense that would make your application work. So you actually had to do that by hand yourself. So Bundler was created to solve that problem. Uh, I think other things that were created during the times like Tor is a command line for you to generate command line tools, right? It's a framework for generating the Rails command, for example, is built on Tor. A lot of those toolings that today we use were created during that time. Yeah, I remember starting in 
my first Rails job, we had the Rails 2.3 app, I think. And because there was no bundler, one of the gems we used was like needed to be a, a slightly older patch version. And it took me like two weeks to figure that out from somebody on the team finally telling me that. I feel like that was a wild time of Rails because it probably is the biggest amount of changes, would you say, that happened all at once? Yes. I, I think that like today people still are afraid of these. Even people that did not leave at that time, but people are afraid of, I don't want to upgrade my Rails application because so I had hard. And it's true, like between 2.3 and three, three, 0 was a very hard upgrade to make. But after that, it actually became very easy compared with the Ruby or oh, Rails 2.3 upgrade. Yeah, and at that same time, wasn't there like prototype JS and things like switch to CoffeeScript and then we've yeah. had a lot of changes there. I think CoffeeScript was Rails 3.1, but we had from prototype to jQuery in 3.0 because yeah, who the case was was also in the jQuery card team. Oh yeah, right. That makes sense. Yeah, that was an interesting time. So when did like Rails engines become a thing? I think we Rails 2.3, they already existed, but it was a very simple version of what we have today. In Rails 3.0 was the first time that we had these architectures that we have today, like engineers real the applications, and that we started to actually take advantage of. So that Rails modular today is like, you can generate a Rails application. And if you actually check your like application RB file, you have a require Rails slash all there. If you change that for any of the engines, you can actually remove parts of the frameworks that you don't want to use. For example, if you don't need database assets, you can remove active records. If you don't need assets, it's pockets, asset generator. So, why it is said before Rails 3, I think it was the first time that it started to actually be used as a way to modularize the framework. Could you give like a super simple explanation of a rail tie? What is a rail tie? I would say the simplest explanation is like, is a plugin system. It's just something to tell you that you can plug in other things, right? So our Rails application, we execute all the rail ties you have loaded in memory. And by executing that real tie, you can tell like, oh, I want you to add this folder to the Rails application. Or I want you to add this configuration to this Rails application. So it's just a very simple plugin system that you can add to Rails applications and libraries as well. So a lot of libraries take advantage of those. You actually don't need real ties to plug in Rails application. But if you actually want a nice integration, for example, if you want to set up initializers, or configurations of your application, changing the generators, a good example is our spec as well, right? If you do a Rails scaffold, you get mini test by default. If you start our spec Rails, you get mini test by default. That integration is made using a real tie. That was a great explanation. Thank you. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, you should explain kind of how the Rails engine built on top of the real tie for anybody who's not familiar. Yes. So, like, Real ties engines applications, they are all part of the same inheritance chain. Real tie is the base class. Engines inherit for real ties. And applications inherit for engines. And the main difference between applications and engines is like we can only have one application in memory and we can have many engines in memory. And the application is responsible for doing the boot time of the application. But engines, they are very similar to applications. They know where to put code. For example, the app folder. They can have configurations like the config folder. If you look at engine or a Rails application for the structure, they are very similar. I don't think there, there is any difference. So what else like the engine is responsible to? It's like, it's also responsible for configuring the, actually to respond to requests. So when you actually receive a request from the web server, like the Rails application, of course, is responsible for that. But you can mount in your routes to say, okay, this path is that engine is going to be responsible for. What's the step of that device? When you say a device for users, we are configuring the Rails routes to send out the request to authentication to the 
controllers inside the device. Yeah, and you can, and I guess maybe active storage is an example of one where like yes. an engine can actually just directly add routes to the main Rails app and you don't have to mount it. Yes. Yeah, I think actual test is another step of that. Yeah. Like Asian is pretty much Rack applications. And if you don't know what Rack is, just a specification for web applications in Ruby. And Rack are applications that respond to a single method that's call. So Asian is respond to call and applications also respond to call. But Reatite does not respond to call at all. Okay, that's interesting. That makes sense. So how is the engine approach? Because I know that Shopify uses engines a lot, and that's one of the big guiding philosophies of how things are organized. How has that helped organize such a big application like Shopify? We have a few blog posts about this topic. In the beginning, we what we did was just to move files around, kind of trying to break the monolith in smaller units of the domain. Like we have units like the checkout part is a different unity. We have applications like as another unity. We have merchandise. We break those applications in small units. And in the beginning, we thought that Rails engine would not fit our user case. Mostly because the thing that was investigated this was not actually like very aware how agents work. But now like we use agents as a way to isolate those components from each other. So we are not there yet. But one of my dreams is to actually be able to deploy a few parts of the Shopify monolith in different computers with different classes loaded in memory. For example, we send a lot of requests for the checkout part of the application that's different from the structured part of the application. Let's say I'm having a flight say, oh, I'm going to get like thousands of checkouts per minute and I want to like put more capacity in my servers. I should be able to say, okay, let's increase the number of servers that only are going to serve the checkout, but don't have all the memory usage that like the short front part also brings, right? So my goal is to be able to isolate those parts so well that we can boot parts of the monolith in different servers in different ways. That sounds pretty amazing. That would be a thing I would feel like people would be like, oh, this is why we have microservices. So we can, each service can respond up and down, but then you can make the argument, oh, well, we could do this with a monolith still. And that's pretty, pretty cool. Yes. I think it's an in-between solution, right? Like we could go all in with monolith. So it, go all in, in microservices. With this one, we actually can choose if you want like a few servers be a monolith or other servers being just part of the monolith that are small enough to serve like the requests we are going to receive. So what are some of the challenges of pulling that off? Is that something that will take a lot of work to make happen? I think one of the challenges is like the lack of tooling. I mean, if we were going to start application for Scratch today, using that approach, we would be probably very slow compared with like anyone building an application without that setup. So the reason is because you need to be thinking about, oh, what are the domains I have? Where this file should be? How I communicate between the, those two parts of the application without actually coupling them together? But for us, it's the opposite direction. We have a big monolith and we are breaking smaller parts. So we need to tell us like, oh, this part here is actually trying to access constants or methods that are defining this other part. And that's why we built a tool called Parkwork that is able to tell us like where we are crossing the boundaries between components. The good part about this tooling is it's a gradual tooling. So you can choose to not fix the things right now. You can fix later, right? Like you can say, okay, I know there is an error here, but I'm going to ignore this error, like record it to a deprecation list. But I think the other part that is not still, I don't add yet, is like being able to load this. Like we need Rails applications to actually be able to tell what those are used together. So like the Rails framework itself don't have the 
capacity to do of this yet. But I also don't know exactly what we need. And that's why we are building. I'm curious. So this is really cool conversation, like the ideas that you have for doing this. So you mentioned that you basically started a team at Shopify of like, and now 40 plus people. Is this like the work your team does at Shopify is like thinking about this kind of stuff? I guess, would you mind explaining kind of what your team is there? So my team was actually expanding the what it was responsible for over the time. In the beginning, we were only responsible for Rails inside Sh- Shopify and also outside. So the team was myself and two more people. And what we are doing was mostly trying to keep Rails up to date inside the monolith. And like building fully, uh, actually helping Shopify and Rails to go forward, building the Rails releases. And then we started to work with you start typing with Sobe along with Stripe. Like Stripe was were kind enough to allow us to have access to Sobe before everyone else. And we started to experiment inside that same monolith, kind of trying to create a tooling to work with various applications, given Stripe is not a real shop, it's only a Ruby shop. So we wrote tooling, tapioca, there are a bunch of bunch of other tooling that Tapioca depends on that are like tooling to help so be to understand the metaprogramming that Rails uses a lot. And then the team also started to work with Ruby itself. Initially, it's just like small contributions here and there trying to solve like bugs in Ruby that we found while deploying our application in, with the new Ruby versions. But now we are building tools like YJIT and a project called the variable with a location that's changed the way Ruby deals with memory layout. We started to contribute to Truffle Ruby as well. I have a team just like working with Truffle Ruby to help Oracle to, with the goal of have a production running Rails app. And we also expanded the team to actually deal with the monolith itself and tooling around the Ruby ecosystem, like Ruby Chains bundle. And the thing that deals with the monolith is the one that we experiment with all those like pack work and like breaking the monolith in smaller unit. That's awesome. It sounds like a lot of really cool stuff to work on, but just as like a consumer of the Ruby and Rails language, it sounds like y'all are doing a lot for us. And that's awesome. Yes. Uh, I think that's how I feel as well. Like after going to Ruby Cloud and like having most of those folks there, I could see like that we are doing a lot for the community. We had, I think, six, 15 speakers during Rubicoff. Wow. We, we are building a, a bunch of cool stuff and like planning to actually spend this work way more. Yeah, that is amazing. We're building much smaller applications, but still getting the benefits of all of those tools and Ruby improvements, and Rails improvements and It's just so cool to work in open source where we can all contribute and help each other. Yeah, I think like Shopify always had the open source DNA in the company. Like Toby, our CEO, was part of the Rails team. But like when I joined the company, like my goal was actually change a little bit the focus of my team to not be a a Rails team working inside Shopify, but actually a Rails team working for the community but leverage what we are building for the community inside Shopify. I think it's turning out very well. You reminded me that a couple months ago, just for fun, I downloaded the earliest version of Rails I could find. And I saw Toby had written authentication system gem or whatever way back when. And that was like cool to see that Shopify has been around since the very earliest days of Rails and still chugging along just fine with it. It's grown alongside. So that is awesome. One of the things that I'm sure many people want to hear about is when is Rails 7 coming out? What is new there and all of those things. So you want to touch on kind of the state of Rails 7, where it's at and where it's headed? Yeah, just release it live on the podcast. <laughs> no, okay. I, I could, but I should eat. <laughs> just, it just has to yank it right away. Just think of the ratings. <laughs> In terms of state, I think it's pretty much ready in terms of features. 
the biggest feature we have changed the way we deal with front end in Rails applications. I actually not very familiar with the new system, like it's mostly DHH. But what I know is Turbo, Hotwire, Stimulus, Protochef, all those libraries are ready to release. What's missing is actually my work that's mostly removing all the deprecated code that we introduced in Rails 6.1. Uh, just make sure that everything works together, like how the JS versions are act, like the generators are actually using the right versions of Sprockets Rails, of like Stimulus in Turbo. We still have a few features that are being introduced. For example, today we had a PR merger to introduce a new API for deal with errors. I know that like sometimes it's only bad is one of your sponsors. So like you can use that new API to publish your host to Honey Badge. So Honey Badge, like all the others, like New Relic, they could use the same API in Rails to actually communicate with the service. What's the other feature that was just introduced? it? Oh yeah, like one thing we are dealing right now is actually Rails is thread safe, but it's not fiber safe yet. And given we have the new Firebase schedule or Ruby 3, and we also have Falco as a web server. If you try to raise application using Falco, you're probably going to find a bunch of errors. And today we also merged the feature that we allow people to, to change the application to be either fiber safe or thread safe. I don't think it's possible to be both right now, but in your case, I like one of those two modes. That's pretty cool. I look at things like Falcon and I wonder like, could I adopt that? Would my Rails app just be like, what are you doing? That's really cool. If you're listening to this podcast, then who's making sure that your application is running correctly? Is the app up? Are bugs plaguing your users? Do your cron jobs execute correctly? I don't have to worry about this because I have a secret weapon, Honey Badger. Honey Badger works with my unique workflow, is easy to set up on all my projects, and gives me peace of mind throughout the day. The best part is that Honey Badger has all the tools I need in an easy-to-understand UI with excellent documentation. I want to build features, not waste time trying to configure my tools, and Honey Badger provides that for me out of the box. Sign up for Honey Badger today and let them know we sent you. Thanks to Honey Badger for their continued support of the show. I ask every Rails core team member this, so feel free to just tell me to F off. What would it take for us to get some authentication in the core Rails library? That's a good question. As a device maintainer, I actually don't know this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I spoke with Joseph Ali about this a while ago. Like when we built the device, we actually thought it was a good idea to give people, like, I would say, a hidden implementation of authentication, but everyone wants something different. And then you have to customize your controllers. And I think Andrew, in one of the podcasts about Asian, is was saying, I hate Asians because everything is hidden for me. And I don't know how to change anything. So I think that was a mistake at the time to actually build device as authentication library, not as authentication generator. And if you look at the Phoenix framework, Jose Valle did the opposite. Instead of building a library for Phoenix, he actually built a generator inside Phoenix to generate authentication capabilities for Phoenix applications. I would probably want to build that instead of a library today with like a new framework side of Rails. And I don't know, I never discussed this with David, but I think he would be probably open for a generator for authentication. I read a blog post about generating the Phoenix generator for authentication. And he touches on some of the things you, you said y'all talked about where like he talks about device and it became widely used. And it's like, uh-oh, people are having problems. And the generator thing is interesting. I haven't even thought about that in the context of Rails, but I'm ready for active auth or action auth. I, I never know which word to use there, but the A auth, I'm ready. I mean, like we've talked about auth being in Rails in the past. And I think that's kind of one of the argument that we've kind of been bringing up is, look, everyone has their own implementation of authentication. You know, you could get by with device for so long and then you want to add SSO into a FA and a PGP key or, you know, all this other stuff. And then suddenly device may not be the right solution. So yeah, if it was just a way to generate the safe stuff for you, that would be nice. I don't know. <laughs> That's almost like scary in a way because that means that more developers are going to be touching more authentication code, which I mean, I don't want to touch authentication code. So 
I think one of the advantages I saw with device is like the number of people actually auditing their code is huge, right? Like everyone wants to attack device applications and it's open source. So they can look at the source code and say, okay, there is attack here. So I think device had a lot of like security fixes built in the library already that would probably like not be the same if you generate just authentication code by yourself. You probably have a bunch of security holes that you don't even know about. And the generator can make the authentication stuff the first time, but then applying those fixes later on becomes harder because the more changes you make, it makes a, a generator trying to edit code that it doesn't know about is yeah. pretty tough, I would imagine. And also like, how would you know if your code is vulnerable or not? Someone would need to attack you and submit a report to you or either like attack you and you see only later that you got attacked, right? But with a library, you would know like, okay, my version like of the device 1.0 has two security fixes that one does not have. Maybe it's a split between the authentication generator and you have a sort of test suite that you can ship. That would be where the new attacks would be added. So you could update that and then run that against your older generated authentication and see what you're vulnerable to as it goes on over time or something. It would be kind of interesting. It's definitely a hard problem, right? Yes. Chris, I'm ready to sponsor you to write that PR for Rails. <laughs> It'd be an interesting one. I like that we have the has secure password and it wouldn't be bad to go through and basically set up the registration sessions, reset your password controllers and have all of that as a generator. That wouldn't be too bad. And it would be just harder to keep it up to date or secure for everybody, I think. But Yes. You know. Fortunately, a lot of those attacks, they can happen in any layer of your application. It could be your controller that's actually doing the checks wrongly or actually is vulnerable to, for a time attack or your models that actually don't validate the right information. Even one of the features that I never thought would be a problem, like he said that password can also be like vulnerable to attacks. So you have features in the device to actually help you to build a secure, robust reset password feature. Yeah. One of the questions that I'm sure all of us have had at some point is, how are you making commits to like every single Rails repository? I see your face on every repository all the time. And I don't know how you're so productive with merging all these things. <laughs> yeah, and in PRs and issues like everywhere. Well, right now is is my job, right? Like I like that's my my job. I work eight hours a day on this, so it's actually easy. When I started, it was actually not my job. I actually to do that during my personal time. There was a time I was working sixteen hours a day, eight hours as a consultant, and eight hours as an open source developer. It was very hard. I actually ended up having a burnout because of it. Well, yeah, today I actually avoid to work after my work hours. But I think I'm glad that during my work, I'm able to touch so much software. Like Shopify is a huge application and we depend on a lot of libraries people use in the community. So like most of the commits people see is actually me fixing problems for Shopify. It makes perfect sense, right? When I was talking with Casper recently, he mentioned something that you reminded me of where he was... We were talking about some of the like method names and things in Rails. And he said something about, you know, like the important thing is for Rails to get the clarity, the naming right, so that we save time for everyone. Because if you put a confusing method or something into Rails, then you're not only wasting your own time or whatever, but you're going to end up wasting time with the whole community trying to understand something. How do you go about? determining, you know, there's pull requests for everybody's trying to do different things and they're trying to make features of Rails. How do you decide what fits in Rails and what doesn't? Because that seems like a really hard problem to figure out. I think that's also a very hard thing to answer. And I'm saying that because 
even spoke with Casper about this. Like to me, everything is automatic now. Most of the decisions I make today, I don't have to think much. Like I don't spend hours or days. Like I, I watch your screen cache with Casper and I want to say like, I would never leave you be out with that level of like commitment that like he spent hours trying to find a good name for the, the thing. I would probably come and say, I don't like the name and go away. I would not <laughs> I be the it. one. I would not be the one suggesting name. But I think after doing this for a while, you actually get like most of the decision make from working your head and everything becomes so fast, automatic. But to me, like the way I think about Rails is, is the feature going to be easy to maintain in the long term? If it's something very small, an option here and there, it's probably fine. Like even that I would not use myself, but like I could see other people using and I see that the implementation is not big enough that would not cause trouble to me. But that can also grow to a point where like the same method now have 25 options. So it is when I start to say, okay, like we went too far in this, so I cannot accept any new options anymore. So either I think I need to think in a better way to allow this person to build on top of this, or I need to change the API. And that's how we actually end up having so many deprecations between Rails version. It's because in this process of building the framework, we end up in a situation where we need to rethink the approach because it was really organically to the point that became a pain point. One well, good example for me is the enos Active Record enos Like we had a feature that was introduced and they said, okay, this feature by itself is fine. But then now everyone wants to disable I scope here, I scope there. I, I think Enos have probably nine different options. So even as a user, when you are debugging an application that uses Active Record DNA, you don't know what to expect because it depends on what options are being called in, in that, for that DNA. So I'm the kind of person that prefers to make fast decisions and actually block people. That's also another reason why you see my name everywhere, because I also try to introduce most of the pull requests inside the framework without much friction, unless I think it's probably too big or it's going to cause a problem to the framework. I also like having many of the decisions that I don't even do. I don't know how to explain why I make them. Like one of the days, like people introduce change to Rails that I immediately see this way to break someone's application. I say, okay, this is a break change. Don't do that. But I don't know how I did find those things anymore. So here's what I want. All right. I'm going to pitch you on this idea. I just want to use a different primary key for global IDs, right? So how much is it going to cost to oil that up? <laughs> So it sounds like Rails 7 is almost there. If you had to guess when it would be released, would you be willing to guess? I think second week of December. Like I said, it's just missing the things I'm supposed for right now. That's mostly removing the deprecated code. I plan to finish that next week. After that, we are going to have a beta, probably the beta one. Usually the beta takes one or two weeks between each other. But I think because we had the alpha for the first time, it is the first time we ever had a Rails alpha. Most of the issues are already being like reported. So I do expect a huge beta phase. And that's why I think in December, second week of December, we will have a Rails release. Nice. Yeah, because I didn't realize we've never had a Rails alpha before. I guess it's always been beta and then RC. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, and this one's been a bigger change because of Hotwire. And then all of the like little things around the edges, which are like import maps and JS bundling and CSS bundling and whatever to kind of support that as well. So it's an interesting release in that it's not a lot of Ruby changes or features, but a lot of front end changes for once. Yes. We always had trouble with allowing people to test features as soon as possible. So especially with like major releases like Rails 7, it's not easy to tell people, okay, we are going to introduce this feature, try it now. We only were able to do that in the past where we release a, a beta or RC is when people actually start to try out. So this time we actually want people to try the hotwire, hot maps like feature 
And that's why we release the alpha. But this is a problem I always thinking in the back of my head, like how do I allow people to test things earlier without having to do a race release? Because doing a race release is a huge commitment because now we have to like, tell all the libraries in the ecosystem to update as well, right? Like I think one of the troubles we had was with device. And so we released the alpha device was actually the, the blocker for most people to upgrade. Yeah, that was basically the like status code for responses when you failed to log in or whatever needed to change in the responders gem and a few little tweaks like that. But yeah, it does have sort of ripple effects through there. And then all of those need to kind of, they need maybe a branch that is ready for the new version for a while before. And I guess probably too, like the sooner people are trying the new Rails version, the more support and things you will, or like issues and things that will come. And if a feature isn't totally ready yet, you might be getting a lot of reports that are kind of like, well, we know that's broken and we're going to address it, but we're not sure how yet. And that makes it probably a little bit of extra work if you do it a little too soon, you know, before it's fully baked or whatever. Yeah. So it makes sense. Is there any plans for like, because I know, and you can talk on kind of how you do things front end JavaScript wise in Shopify. Are there any plans to adopt something like Hotwire going forward? Yes. So Shopify has a very distinct front end team. Like most of our admin is built on top of React. Even a different application is not inside the same Rails application. But we also have a bunch of internal applications at Shopify, like things like our project management tool. We have like Eskify application that's pretty much a application to allow people to do like ask me anything events. So people ask things in that application. So those like applications that kind of became important inside Shopify, they are going to start to be built using Hotwire. I would say a Rails backend like view framework, not React, but like actually like action view, partials and the Hotwire stimulus, kind of decreasing the complexity in how we build front ends inside Shopify, at least for those internal applications. How have you felt about Shopify's movement to types? Do you like it? Because I actually interviewed a Shopify and they were telling me like, oh yeah, we use types for everything now. Uh, so how's that kind of change been for you? That's actually a good question because I was responsible for doing this, for actually introducing types inside Shopify. And sometimes I even joke with my team that they got the worst stakeholder for that project. Because like in the beginning I was, I hate types, I don't want to do types. I don't want this to be introduced to the company, but you need to prove me wrong. You need to prove me that types is something we should be using in this company. And I think the team did a great job actually like building a lot of hypotheses and proving them to not only to me, but for the entire Shopify community. I think the first thing I realized that when I was working with my team is like just by introducing the survey tooling, like you don't need to type anything just by using it we removed two classes of exceptions that was happening in production. It was not going to happen at all anymore. Name errors, that's when you name your constant wrongly. Like, you cannot have questions that don't exist anymore in your code. And I don't remember the other one, but I remember it was two classes of errors that went away. And after that, I was actually very, like, I guess the the verbosity of going to your Ruby files I actually have to add types. But after working a code base that have type formation enough to be useful, I actually am one of the, those people that go to files and start to add signatures everywhere. Because like it became way easier to work in a code base. Actually, like I think the best part is not actually see the errors on CI. It's seeing errors or your editor when you are typing is seeing out completing information when you are actually using the writing of code because now the types you can out complete correctly. It's not actually methods that you think exist, but they don't. It's actually methods that you know exist in the places. So I'm a converted person now. I prefer to write Ruby with types. I would never write Rails framework with types because I think 
it probably is not going to give a lot of advantages, at least to me. But application like Shopify or even small applications we are built inside the company, I think it gives a lot of advantages. And it's not even the safety, it's actually the development productivity you get for having feedback quickly in your like test editor. Why did Shopify choose Sorbet? Or is it just timing instead of RBS? It's a little bit of timing, but it's also like RBS is mostly a syntax. It's not a tooling, right? So there is no tooling yet that's as good as Sorbet in the community, even for RBS. Sorbet is fast, very fast, because it does the type check statically. And it takes, I think, 12 seconds in 2 millions of code base. So it's very fast. And if you are using that, the integration is actually milliseconds to see any results. But yeah, it's mostly because there is no tooling better than this will be right now, but uh, timing also played a little bit because when we started to look on this, the RBS specification was not even created yet. We actually had a little bit of input on RBS, the specification itself, because we wrote our RBS passer for Sobe, so we could understand both formats. I also initially thought that having external files with the type formation is worse than having the type formation line. Even though I like the, or oh, I think the so base syntax is very bold, having to move between two files to write code is actually worse than just like add the signature in the same file. I think that's the thing that keeps me from even wanting to try like RBS right now. I guess, I don't know, you have me like pretty interested in Sorbet though. Like you, the fact that you're like, oh, I'm a convert now. I'm like, oh, well, maybe I just kind of blindly follow everyone. So now I'm like, mm, maybe I should try it again. I've already installed the gem and it's too late. Yeah, so and also like when we started, Sobe was actually a very mature tool, but Sobe support for Rails was not at all. Even basically things like try to call a method for active record object, but the method is generated by the caller, we w- would get a type error, right? Because Sobe does not understand that. But after we built Tapioca, I think it actually became way better to build Rails applications use. So, so is your thinking on never using types in Rails because you want the community to have the freedom to do things any way they would like if they're using Rails? Or what are your thoughts there? It's mostly because so types, especially so base, is going to restrict a lot to what we can build in Rails. And like it's probably fine to, actually, I would say it's totally fine to have those restrictions in Rails applications. Because I don't want to use application full of metaprogramming that like you actually don't understand what's going on. But most of what Rails is today is because of the metaprogramming we have in Ruby. And so they would restrict us a little bit on what we can build for Rails. Like most of the features we have in Rails will probably not exist if we had so big. But I don't think applications need that level of Ruby usage, I would say. Yeah. I wonder if Can you imagine a middle ground where like some paths that people happen to do the the wrong thing a bunch of times, if it would help to hint at some of the ones that could be more strict? I'm just trying to think of like, there's a lot of times where the current user is nil and you call first name on it. If there were certain things like that, where you could be like, hey, this needs to be, you know, a hash or whatever, like some of the options for maybe like your active record associations where it's, this should be a symbol or a string or whatever, maybe that would be useful, but maybe not. I think that actually would be useful. And that's kind of what Sobe builds. Sobe, or oh, not Sobe, Tapioca builds, because Tapioca is going to, generates at not at runtime, but statically based on the runtime information, the signature for those methods that Rails generates. So like, for example, it knows that integer column in my SQL is going to generate either a new value or an integer and never a string in your module. So you cannot call like it starts with in that method, right? Because it starts with does not exist in integer types. So I think the middle ground would be for we providing type information for Rails without having to type Rails itself. So when I say type information, is either RBS or RBI format. 
And I, my team started to look on that and actually see if we can generate type formation for some of the Rails methods. I think that would be really cool because it definitely help any newbies that are learning that they have to pay very close attention to certain things like pluralization is an easy one that I see a lot of people will type, you know, at user and then it's actually them querying for a relation instead and they get multiple users and like those little things can sometimes provide really helpful errors and information while you're typing your code. And I think that would be interesting to see as a additional documentation in a way. I think that's one of the advantage of types that people usually forget. It's like you're also typing that as a documentation. Like you're telling people, I expect those inputs. Like, yes, I'm going to actually fail if you pass the wrong inputs. But like, it's also something that you can read. I see I can pass all those types. Like I can pass a hash here or a proc that I was not knowing that I could pass a proc. Yeah, that's one that's a good example because there's a lot of times where you can pass in anything that's callable or a string or a symbol or whatever, and those will get converted to the right things. And it's hard to provide when you're writing the documentation for that method. You're going to maybe do a couple examples, but you're not going to go through every single iteration of, hey, you can make a class that implements the call method and pass that in. You'll just have a proc example or something instead. And it would be, that sort of little nudge in the documentation that, yes, you can do all of that too. Well, this is fun. You guys have any other questions before we go? I just wanted to say thank you for all your work. Yes. Really, we hinted at it earlier that we're the consumer and we get to use all the things. People like you are the reason we get to have fun in the community. So thank you. Yeah, it's great to meet you, Ruby Goff. Thank you. Like for me, like it's actually a pleasure to be serving the Ruby community for almost 10 years now. I also benefited a lot before becoming, I would say, a producer of like things that people can consume. But uh, like it's a community I love to be part of every Ruby conference. I'm very, very happy to see a bunch of friends that I made in those 10 years. Well, we're sure glad to chat with you and so glad you're part of the community and everything. We'll include a link to your Twitter and stuff too so people can find you and I'm sure they will see you around on the GitHub repos. Yes, definitely. Cool. All right. Well, if that's everything, I guess we'll end it here. Goodbye. Later. Later.